Richard Benjamin Speck grew up in the flat expanses of rural West Central Illinois. Where were you born at, Rich? Where was I born? Yeah. Kirkwood, Illinois. When was you born? December 6, 1941. Speck entered the world the day before the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. They out of court, all hell broke loose next to us. And stop six. Richard was the seventh child of Benjamin and Mary Speck, a hard-working couple who struggled every month to pay the mortgage on their modest house. To provide for his new son, Benjamin Speck picked up more hours at his many odd jobs, working as a farmhand and laying roof tiles. When Richard was old enough, his father took him to a nearby lake to fish for bluegills. The outings became special moments where Richard had his father all to himself. The carefree time spent with his father was a respite from the austere, deeply religious household run by his mother. The family attended the United Presbyterian Church, and Mary insisted on strict rules against smoking and drinking. Her husband once endured a severe reprimand after having a beer at a fish fry. In 1947, Richard lost the light-hearted influence of his father when Benjamin died of a sudden heart attack. The six-year-old was devastated. His elementary school classmates noticed changes in his behavior. Richard began whining and eating crayons, acting more like a toddler than a second grader to get extra attention from his teachers. We were watching a movie, and I happened to glance back and notice uh, the teacher with Richard Speck sitting on her lap. I asked her, why was Richard sitting on your lap? And she replied, oh, Richard Speck was acting like such a big baby. I couldn't think of any better place to put him. At home, Richard was spoiled by his older sisters, but received little comfort from his destitute widowed mother. Soon after Benjamin's death, a traveling insurance salesman named Carl Lindbergh began courting Mary Speck. Their marriage in 1950 solved Mary's financial problems, but Lindbergh was the exact opposite of Richard's sober, hardworking father. He had a criminal record that included arrest for forgery and drunk driving. Eight months after Richard's mother remarried, the couple picked up and moved to Dallas with Richard and his younger sister, Carolyn. Nine-year-old Richard deeply resented his mother's decision to remarry and relocate, and he let it show. Years later, in prison, Speck would recall that the disruption in his family life made it easy for him to reject his strict religious upbringing. The preacher says, oh, we got a new faith system here. Well, we're going to give you a spirit to check out three hymns. I stood up and I want him, him, and him. And they kicked me out of church. <laughs> it wasn't long before his stepfather wanted to kick Richard out of the house. He would get drunk call Richard a gutter rat and tell him he couldn't stand the sight of him. To get back at Lindbergh, Richard would break into his liquor cabinet, have his fill, and disappear from the house. By the time he was 15, Richard was getting drunk nearly every day. He dropped out of school and began hanging around with a tough crowd of older teens who introduced him to marijuana, pills, and the basics of crime. Richard started carrying a switchblade and learned how to use it to pick window locks. He also learned about sex, mostly one-night stands with the older girls in his crowd and prostitutes. He began to develop contempt for any woman he considered easy. By the age of 20, Richard was a known petty criminal. He had a long list of misdemeanors, drunk and disorderly conduct, indecent exposure, and shoplifting. His slick back, dirty blonde hair, deeply pockmarked face, and crude tattoos made him look dangerous. A tattoo on Speck's forearm read, born to raise hell, but it was the empty boast of a young man who always wished he was tougher. Absolute coward. Take away a knife and a gun, and he has no ability to fight with his fist, yet he had uh, a, a tremendous skill at animal cunning at being able to put people at ease, to kind of 
He was a good burglar, uh, he was a good thief, and he was a good liar. Richard was not at all intimidated by the cops and knew how to turn on his good old boy charm in a pinch. When that failed, his mother always came to his rescue. No matter how often he needed to be bailed out of jail, his mother paid his way. Mary Speck's unconditional love for her delinquent son allowed Richard to bury his resentment for her. She became a saint in his eyes, an impossible ideal that Speck used to judge every other woman in his life. Especially 16-year-old Shirley Malone. Richard met Shirley at the Texas State Fair in October 1961 and got her pregnant after three weeks of dating. They quickly married. Speck's job as a truck driver for the 7-Up Bottling Company was supposed to support them both, but the 21-year-old usually blew his paychecks on prostitutes and alcohol. Richard insisted on a far different standard of behavior for his wife. He had what we technically call a Madonna prostitute complex. In other words, women were either virginal and pure, and if they weren't, then they were totally to be considered as tramps, sluts, whores, prostitutes. He felt that she was in the prostitute category because he felt that she'd been unfaithful to him. And the minute he got that idea, she was totally no good. Shirley denied ever cheating on him. But Speck didn't believe her and wanted to punish her any way he could. He would pick up lady friends and drive them to his apartment. As his pregnant wife watched, he kissed and fondled them in the car, laughing at her before speeding off. Richard also refused to pay Shirley's medical bills and was not around for the birth of his daughter, Robbie Lynn, in July 1962. At the time, he was serving a short sentence in the county jail for disturbing the peace. His first trip to state prison came 16 months later for forgery. Speck served that stint with ease, and by the age of 23 was back on the streets, more dangerous than before. His contempt for his wife now turned violent. Richard demanded sex from Shirley four or five times a day. If she refused, he slapped and choked her. Richard seemed obsessed with the criminal life and bragged that someday he would make headlines. There was this story in the Dallas Sunday papers, and he was reading the papers that morning and, and made the comment that someday uh, he was going to do something that would also be a, of equal publicity. In January 1965, Speck tried to make good on his boast. He attacked a woman at knife point in the parking lot of a Dallas apartment building. She got away. Speck was arrested. Once in custody, Richard claimed he couldn't remember much of the incident because he had blacked out after having too much to drink. His story worked. Instead of facing charges for attempted rape or murder, he was given the chance to plead guilty to aggravated assault. This time, Speck only served five months in prison due to a bureaucratic slip-up. By January 1966, Shirley decided that she had had enough and filed for divorce. Two months later, in March, Speck robbed a grocery store and a warrant was issued for his arrest. Rather than face another prison term, the 24-year-old Speck fled Texas and headed back to his childhood home in rural Illinois. Richard's older siblings were still living there, he clung to the idea that he could turn back the clock and recapture the happiness of his early boyhood before his father died. But Speck's journey home would offer him no escape. The demons that had driven him to a life of crime were growing uncontrollable. In March 1966, Richard Speck was a man on the run. He had fled an arrest warrant in Dallas and returned to his hometown of Monmouth, Illinois. The 24-year-old was desperate to recover some remnant of his early childhood, of the days spent fishing with his late father. But Speck just didn't fit in anywhere. I think Richard Speck was just a different cut of person than what we were used to in our town. He was a stranger and dressed kind of flashy. 
His brothers and sisters were well aware of his troubles with the law down in Texas, but Richard promised that he had outgrown his wild ways. They wanted to believe him and did what they could to help. Richard's sisters found him cheap room and board with family friends. His brother William was a carpenter and got Richard a job sanding plasterboard for another carpenter in town. Initially, Richard didn't let them down. He showed up for work on time and kept his tattoos covered. But Speck's dream of recapturing his past was quickly shattered. After only two weeks in Monmouth, he learned that his ex-wife Shirley had remarried. The news overwhelmed Richard, dredging up memories of betrayal and abandonment. He quit his job, moved into a cheap hotel, and lost himself in a haze of alcohol and pills. One night, Richard tagged along with a group of locals for some late night drinking in a neighboring town. During the car ride, Richard started bragging about the woman in Dallas who he had nearly killed. He started talking about the woman in Texas that he'd threatened with a knife, and it was different than all of us guys that I drank with, you know? We talked about different stuff than that, you know? So it was a little bit off the wall for our group of people. When they arrived at the bar and sat down, Speck showed off an eight-inch hunting knife he called his insurance policy in case of a fight. He was somebody to be scared of or apprehensive of, but I was scared of him. Plain and honest truth, I was scared of him. Speck's rage was building, and his need to avenge what he considered his ex-wife's betrayal was driving him to commit an even more violent crime. On the night of April 2nd, 1966, Speck broke into the home of a 65-year-old woman in Monmouth. Speaking softly and brandishing a knife, he blindfolded the woman and politely assured her that she would not be harmed if she complied. After raping her, he sliced her housecoat into strips and used them to tie her arms and legs together. Then he disappeared. The woman told police her attacker had a soft southern drawl. In a small town on the Illinois prairie, few people fit that description, and Speck became the prime suspect. After brief questioning by police, he skipped town. One act of criminal behavior led to another. Once he started, once he went down that road, it was apparently difficult or impossible for him to turn back. Speck was being chased by the law for the second time in as many months. He was running out of places to hide. His last chance was Chicago, where his sister Martha lived with her husband, Gene Thornton. Richard showed up on their doorstep claiming he had left Monmouth because the local mafia was trying to force him to sell drugs for them. The couple didn't believe him, but Gene found Richard work as a merchant seaman. On April 30th, Speck sailed out of Chicago's Calumet Harbor as a deckhand aboard an ore boat bound for Michigan's Upper Peninsula. After four days, in the midst of a storm, a shipmate found Speck doubled over in pain. The ship's doctor quickly realized that Richard had an acute case of appendicitis. It was definitely an emergency because he was, uh, he was in, in severe pain and uh, he had to be transferred to a hospital right away and the doctor had stated that uh, if it hadn't been within an hour that he more than likely would have died. Richard's appendix was removed in a Michigan hospital. He recovered there for the next two weeks, enjoying the attention he got from the young nurses. His brush with death did nothing to quell Speck's self-abusive nature. When he returned to the ship, he was far more interested in getting high than in working. When he drank, I noticed one thing that he did that most of the other guys didn't do, that he used to take pills. I think he called them redbirds. And he would have a quart of vodka in his hand, and he would swig on that and take pills. Speck's behavior became more and more unpredictable. Once, he fell off the boat. Two other times, he exposed himself to crew members. When he pulled a knife on a superior, it was the last straw. He was fired from the ship on June 14th. As the boat's union representative, Jim Barrell told Speck he could get him his job back, but Speck told him he didn't understand. 
at the time, I don't know what he was talking about. I, you know, I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand what, but it seemed like there was something that uh, he was hiding. Speck was afraid that too much fuss might uncover his prison record and the fact that he was still on the run from the law in two states. He left the ship with his paycheck and visited Judy Lakanimi, a nurse he met at the hospital in Michigan. The brief relationship proved to be a rare moment of grace for Speck. Judy would say later that Richard was a perfect gentleman, showering her with gifts and expensive dinners. After two weeks, they parted on good terms. Richard returned to his sister's house in Chicago, broke. For the next two weeks, he did nothing but nap on the couch and read comic books. His sister finally kicked him out, insisting that he find a job on another ship. On July 12th, he did. But when Speck boarded the boat, he was told that his position had been given to a deckhand with more seniority. Speck was furious. He sulked off with his meager belongings and spent the rest of his money on liquor. He ended up in a quiet little grove next to the Union Hall called Luella Park. Next to the park was an apartment building used by South Chicago Community Hospital to house dozens of its senior nursing students. Speck had seen the pretty young women coming and going. Just three weeks before graduation, they were cramming for their final exams. Richard Speck finally had nowhere left to go. His life was in utter shambles, and his rage was about to explode. In the summer of 1966, Richard Speck was an unemployed ex-con addicted to drugs and alcohol. He was flat broke, alone, and a fugitive. He couldn't get employment. Uh, he already had a wrecked marriage. He was taking pills heavily. He was drinking heavily. Here was a person whose life was going downhill in a hurry. Speck had always believed that he was somehow destined to shock the world. He was about to realize his ambition. On the morning of July 13th, Speck waited outside the National Maritime Union Hall on Chicago's south side, hoping for a berth on a merchant ship. There was none available. So he called his sister Martha, begging for help. Within the hour, she met him in front of the hiring hall and gave him $25. With money in his wallet, Speck had no reason to wait for work. He left for the nearby shipyard inn but not before taking another long look at the apartment complex down the block, filled with young nursing students. Speck took a room at the inn and spent the day drinking and following a middle-aged woman from bar to bar. Around six that evening, he approached her on the street, forced her at knife point up to his room, raped her, and stole a 22 caliber pistol from her purse, stealing the gun, bolstered Speck's nerve. Just after 10 p.m., he walked to the apartment building by Luella Park, dressed in black, armed with a pistol and his switchblade. Speck pried open the back window screen and entered the apartment from the rear. He climbed the stairs, came to a bedroom door, and knocked. 23-year-old Corazon Amaral a native of the Philippines opened the door. Speck leveled the gun at her. He led Amarau at gunpoint through the apartment. Within minutes, Speck roused five other women from sleep and herded them all single file into the largest bedroom. With a wave of the 22, he sat them down and lit a cigarette. He was very beguiling. He sat on the floor, smoked cigarettes, laughed, talked to him. Kept telling him he wasn't going to hurt them. He just wanted to get their money and leave town. Smiling and using his softest Texas drawl, Speck said that he planned to jump a ship heading for New Orleans and began collecting money from the six women one by one. At 11.40 p.m., 22-year-old Gloria Davy came home from a date with her fiancé, 
he now had seven captives, isolated in their corner apartment and out of earshot from their closest neighbors. The women sat terrified, trying to joke with Speck as he casually smoked. They had been trained as nurses through psychology courses to calm people. That was one primary thing that made them think that Speck, you know, we can, we can talk him out of this, we can use our psychology. But the women fell silent when Speck crushed his cigarette, stood up, and flipped open a switchblade. He sliced a bedsheet into long strips, careful to keep the gun within easy reach. He tied each of his prisoners up, binding their hands behind their backs and knotting their ankles tightly. I think he went there to rob them, and I think he went there to see what sexual pleasures might result from the robbery without any clear intent of, of homicide. This video, made years later while Speck was in prison, is the only time on record that he spoke of that night. What you locked up for? I can't murder. Did you kill him? Sure I did. Why? There's one there tonight. In minutes, Speck had all seven young women helpless and immobile on the floor. First, he grabbed 20-year-old Pamela Wilkening, and she showed him her contempt. One of them hit him in the face. Did you go kick me out of the lineup? The insult enraged Speck. He took Wilkening to a bedroom across the hall, gagged her, and pinned her to the floor, intent on raping her. But two other nurses, Marianne Jordan and Suzanne Ferris, unaware of what was going on, walked into the room, surprising Speck. At that point, all of his rage exploded. The women tried to run away, but they never made it out of the bedroom. There's two over there, so I'll off them. Speck stabbed them over 20 times with his switchblade, then turned his attention to the other young women. Wound up trying to kill off all the women. Over the next four hours, Speck methodically killed six more of his captives, washing their blood from his hands after each murder. Why do you use a gun? Why do you do it? Why do you use a knife? You don't make too much noise. There's in no shape to run. The knife's quiet. Speck's nonchalance in the video belies the brutality that he unleashed that night. Valentina Passione's throat was sliced through to her larynx. Patricia Matuzak suffered a vicious kick to her midsection. He saved Gloria Davy for last. She was one of the first ones. She was the last one to go. I knew I had all the time in the world. I heard you got that this one. If the jaw cocked you, said, you'd make it big. That's a thing. On Gloria, it would seem that Speck unleashed a lifetime of buried rage toward all women, especially his mother and his ex-wife. He dragged her downstairs to the couch, raped and sodomized her, then strangled her to death. After checking the large bedroom for valuables and survivors, Speck strolled out of the front door and into the night, he stopped on the Calumet River Bridge to toss his bloody switchblade into the water. He went to bed that night at the Shipyard Inn, believing he had committed the perfect crime. By daybreak, reports of the slaughter were front page news. Our next door neighbor, Mrs. Windmiller, asked me if I heard this awful screaming. And, uh, May we get the uh, other descriptions, Doctor, where the other bodies were and what now, happened? In the uh, east bedroom, there were two girls lying on the floor. The only thing that I might say to this man is that he is psychologically sick and he ought to turn himself in. He ought to... As I said before, this is the crime of the century. Because innocent... There were far more questions than answers. Who would do this? Eight young women who were doing good in the world. All they wanted to do was heal people as nurses. So the questions were, how could they all be killed at once? How did he do it? And then who was he and was he still in the city? That morning, Richard Speck was just a mile from the crime scene 
confidently drinking in the same seedy bars he had been in the night before. But Speck had made a mistake. He'd left a survivor. Throughout the massacre, Corazon Amaral had been huddled under a bed just a few feet away, praying furiously. When he heard that there was a survivor, that's when he immediately changed his name, called a cab, went to Cabrini Green to leave a dead-end trail, and did everything to escape his identity and escape Chicago. Speck wound up a mile and a half west of Chicago's business district among the bums of Skid Row. He checked into a 90 cent a day room under the name R. Franklin. Speck didn't stray far from his hotel, knowing the police would have all public transportation from the city well guarded. By Saturday, July 16th, evidence against Speck was overwhelming. 33 fingerprints were lifted from the crime scene. Based on Corazon Amaral's positive identification, the prints were matched to Speck through Dallas police. Chicago Police Chief O.W. Wilson publicly named Richard Speck responsible for the murders of the eight student nurses. The uproar surrounding the case made Speck's capture seem inevitable, but Richard Speck had no intention of ever facing his accusers. In July 1966, Richard Speck was the most wanted man in America for murdering eight young nurses on Chicago's South Side. He hid away in a Skid Row hotel, but realized that escaping the city was impossible. Three days after the murders, on July 16th, Speck polished off a quart of cheap wine, smashed the bottle, and used the jagged glass to rip gashes through the veins in both his arms. Richard lay down beneath a ceiling of chicken wire in his hotel room, slowly bleeding to death, trapped by the publicity that he had always vowed he'd get. But even slashing a wrist and arm would not prove to be a way out. The hotel handyman discovered Speck and called police. When the cops arrived, they didn't recognize Speck. They rushed him to Cook County Hospital, where his identity was discovered, just beneath the dried blood caked over his arms. And I wiped the blood away, and there was born to raise hell. And I looked at the uh, nurses, and I said, this is the fellow that the uh, police are looking for. Within hours, hundreds of reporters were descending on the hospital for a glimpse of the notorious killer. Speck's court-appointed lawyer, Gerald Getty, and prosecutor Bill Martin received access. I guess you expected to see horns growing out of his head, but to me, he did not look capable of being uh, a person who could murder eight people. Behind Speck's dull eyes was a savagery that only his victims knew. Their last funeral services were held on July 18th, a day honoring the patron saint of nurses, Camillus. It was in everybody's life because everybody knew a nurse and everybody had a daughter or a child that this could have happened to who was at college. That, um, you know, just that the freakishness of, of an intruder coming in invading uh, was, was what was so awful about it. Everybody wanted him to fry. When questioned, Speck's memory of the murders was conveniently lacking. All he could recall, he said, was drinking at the shipyard inn from 6 o'clock until 8, when he claimed to have been given an injection of speed by a stranger. And he said after that, he didn't remember anything. He never denied it. He said, if I'm accused of it, I don't remember it. And that's the most I ever got out of him. His story seemed tailor-made for an insanity defense. As resident psychiatrist of the Cook County Jail, Dr. Marvin Zaporin met with Speck in his cell twice a week. He forged what he believed to be a bond of trust between them. I was operating under the concept of innocent until proven guilty. So I said, this is an allegation against you. Who knows? You say you don't remember it. Maybe it wasn't you, just hypothetically. At which point he would say, of course it was me. Because if he was looking for a way out, he would have leaped at that. But he never tried to do that. 
Zipporin tried to cultivate his patient's creativity and urged Speck to paint, although his first efforts were not exactly helpful to his defense attorney. I went over to see him, and the first painting he did was a uh, painting of a leopard. I'm interviewing a man that I believe was a, a leopard from what he was accused of doing. And I said, you don't want to have those pictures of leopards. Picture, let's have a picture of Bambi. Lo and behold, he did do a picture within two weeks of Bambi. By the fall of 1966, Speck proudly displayed his paintings all over his cell. They had titles like Cabin in the Hills and Good Old Days. Speck was enjoying his time at the county jail. He even had a hot plate in his cell so that he and Zipporin could share coffee. He kept his cell so meticulous, and he was so concerned with every wrinkle that I felt it was almost as if he was a housewife entertaining somebody at a cafe clutch. To Speck, prison was a safe haven from a world that viewed him as a monster who should be destroyed. But the intense press coverage was pushing him to a breaking point. Somewhere along the line, he got a razor blade. And all of a sudden, he took the razor blade, put it to my throat, said, if I'm such a monster as everybody seems to think I am, he said, why don't I just kill you now? And I said, well, because you don't have a quart of alcohol at eight redbirds in you. He said, yeah, I guess that's true. Put it down. Speck's life would not be so easily spared. On October 22nd, a psychiatric panel unanimously concluded that he was competent to stand trial. His conviction and execution seemed only a matter of time. From December 1966 through January 1967, pretrial hearings dragged on in the courtroom of Judge Herbert Passion as a ferocious blizzard descended on Chicago. Speck had long resigned himself to the fact that he would die for his crime. He says that when we get to court, Judge Passion, who hates me with a purple passion, as he put it, he's going to sit there with his band of angels and they're going to crucify me. The mass murder had attracted so much publicity in Chicago that the judge moved the trial downstate to Peoria, where it began on April 3rd. Without drugs or alcohol to bolster his courage, Speck became the shy little boy he had been as a second grader. He wanted to hide from people. He didn't want all this publicity. He would not go into the courtroom until they took him up to the window on the door and he could see me in the courtroom. Then he would go out. On the second day of testimony, prosecutors called Corazon Amaral to the stand to identify Speck. I asked the standard question if she saw the man in the courtroom today. And I kind of thought she would just point, because she was really frightened of Speck. Instead, Corazon got off the witness stand, walked straight up to Speck, thrust a finger in his face, and said defiantly, this is the man. Almost solely on the strength of her testimony, the jury found Speck guilty and sentenced him to death. He said, you see, they finally are going to kill me. Speck was fully prepared to pay for his crimes with his life, but he was not at all prepared for the struggle to survive on death row in one of the country's toughest prisons. In 1967, Richard Speck arrived on death row at Stateville Prison in Joliet, Illinois. The 26-year-old had every reason to fear he would be killed long before he got to the electric chair. In prison, convicts who raped and murdered women were deeply despised. On death row, it would seem that Richard Speck didn't stand a chance. There were three other inmates on death row at the time that had killed three guards, and they immediately started agitating Speck. 
scaring him with what we were going to do to him, and uh, to the point where they, uh, he was almost climbing the walls. After only four days, the warden was forced to transfer Speck to the prison's isolation unit for his safety, where he began working as a janitor. He asked if he could paint his cell. I got him the paint, and he painted his cell and did a, a very nice job of it. And so then we give him a job of painting the entire isolation unit with, to which he did. Speck's prison work afforded him a little freedom, which he exploited for petty scams. He cleaned out the sewer pipes and hid jars of raisins inside them to ferment into alcohol. He also started smuggling cigarettes. Speck, constantly swilling his homemade booze, became known as the drunken painter of Stateville, a moniker that gave him the status he loved. He enjoyed the celebrity within prison because the other inmates or the guards, everybody would, uh, who passed him would say, well, there's Richard Speck, you know Richard Speck. Of course, everybody did. The relatives of Speck's victims were waiting anxiously for his execution, but his appeals dragged on. Then, in June 1971, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed Speck's death sentence, ruling that during his jury selection, potential jurors had been improperly excluded. Without a death sentence hanging over his head, Speck settled into his new life. It was the most stable existence he had known since early childhood. The structure and style and position of authority he held in prison were the highest position he ever held in society. If a hurricane blew down the prison, the only prisoner who would not walk away would be Richard Speck. Beginning in 1976, just 10 years after the brutal murders, Speck became eligible for parole. The families of the slain women were forced to relive their nightmare. I don't think that they should ever release him, and I hope and pray that people will never forget this case and back us up after we're gone. Speck was repeatedly denied parole. He realized that freedom was impossible and disappeared into the depths of the prison's bizarre subculture, a dehumanizing world of violence and sexual abuse ruled by only one law, survival. By 1991, Richard Speck had been in prison for more than half his life. On December 5th, only one day shy of his 50th birthday, he suffered a sudden heart attack. He was rushed to the hospital but could not be saved. The life of Richard Speck, notable only for one savage night of violence, was over. His family didn't want his body. Nobody did. And he was cremated and uh, no one knows except two people where his ashes were even strewn. But the legacy of his heinous crimes did not fade away quite so easily. In 1996, Chicago investigative journalist Bill Curtis uncovered a grotesque reminder of Richard Speck. The disturbing video in which Speck discusses the murders and shows evidence of his bizarre life behind bars. How did you feel after killing those ladies? More shocking than Speck's lack of remorse was his change in appearance. Apparently through the use of hormones, he had transformed his body to ensure his survival in one of America's most dangerous prisons. He had the certain trappings of a female body that made him very desirable to inmates. The breasts and the, you know, silk feminine underwear were all part of the scheme by which he kept himself alive, and not only alive, but, you know, well supplied with goodies like liquor and cocaine because he was what's known as a queen bee in the penitentiary. And then it worked. He didn't get killed like Dahmer. Absolutely cunning survivor. <laughs>
<laughs> That's also what disappointed a lot of people. We wanted him to hurt. We wanted him to be in pain. We wanted him to die. But Speck may have suffered a fate worse than death. 25 years of humiliation and abuse. You like being by me? Absolutely. Have you always liked being by me? Sure. You wearing blue pants today? Yeah. Take one. Take one. They could have been prostituting him out too, and maybe they were. He was probably punished more the way it went than had they have executed him. It was a grotesque transformation. The psychiatrist who became Speck's only confidant believes that by forfeiting his manhood, Speck found a way to punish himself for his crimes. But he felt that somewhere along the line, he had to experience the same kind of degradation and humiliation that he had inflicted on others to feel that he had taken a woman's place, was being used as he had used women. He was a miserable person who lived a miserable life. I, I think he got his justice. Get out of prison. Huh? So often we create a monster out of Richard Speck. And sometimes it is worthwhile to back off and say, well, maybe he wasn't a monster. Maybe he was all too human. That is the most frightening thing of all. They are predators. She was like spider. He was a perfect killing machine. And their prey is human beings. He would literally squeeze the last gasp of breath from his dying victim's body. This is the crime of the century. Who would do this? Biography's profile of serial killers continues.